The uh, Breville Smart Oven is arguably the most sophisticated toaster oven ever conceived. It has five separate heating elements. It has convection cooking capability. It has dozens of program presets, but intelligence enough to do the thinking for you and adapt to whatever you might be preparing, fresh or frozen. All within a shiny professional aluminum frame that's accented by a large LED modern display. You can roast a turkey in it, you can bake muffins, cook a pizza, reheat leftovers. Yes, of course, you can toast up to nine slices of your favorite bread. So you can imagine my surprise, even my utter shock, when I presented this toaster oven as a gift to my wife <laughs> on one of our first anniversaries, only to find that my act of romance and love was met with a lukewarm response maybe even a bit of disgust at receiving that kitchen appliance that she had been talking so much about. I thought I was fulfilling her wildest dreams, and I was actually creating a nightmare for both of us. Well, it's almost 10 years later. I've tried to learn a little bit from that experience, but the husband and wife relationship can be a tricky one, isn't it? It's worth the time, though, to get it right. And I want to suggest to you this morning that outside of our relationship with God himself, the wife-husband relationship might be one of the most significant of all human relationships. This is for many reasons, not the least of which is how it points to the divine image. Will you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5? Ephesians chapter 5. I want to read for you this morning verse 21 through verse 33, the end of the chapter. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21. This is the word of God. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves himself, sorry, he, excuse me, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let each wife see that she respects her husband. This is a well-known text. It's an often preached text. It's an often cited text. It's used and misused, even abused on occasion. Misguided and misinformed people might use it to justify misogyny. More balanced and theologically rigorous individuals will point out from the context and subtext of this passage that it promotes a balanced and healthy two-way respect between men and women, which it does. Move a little further, and you will see the same two-way respect advocated between parents and children. That's at the, at the beginning of chapter 6. Go even further, and you'll see the same relational dynamic that is taught between servants and masters in the middle of Ephesians 6. 
Expand this view a little more, and you'll see the picture that Paul repeats in Philippians chapter 2, where he says, Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This text is about being like Christ in our relationships. So I'm not going to expound that per se for you because you've heard that before. What I want to do is approach this glimpse into the marriage coupling from the lens of the divine image. The divine image that we've been studying for the past several weeks. That's our series. That's where we've been parking, looking for the footprint of God's image within us, his most cherished creation. I want to tell you that understanding how the divine image in humankind relates to the relationship between husband and wife is the key to its monumental significance. That's the reason why this is placed so highly in the important of Paul and in the, important of God, in, the, in the mind of God. It doesn't mean that all godly men need to be husbands or that all godly women need to be wives. There's something here for everyone because everyone, every human, possesses the divine image. We've already learned that. And God is painting for us here a picture. He's giving us an object lesson. And the point, as usual, is to demonstrate his own glory and to grow us to being more like his son in how we relate to one another. And there are four connections to the divine image that I'd like to draw from this text this morning. The first is that mutual submission begins as worship of God. Mutual submission begins as worship of God. If you look at verse 21, submit to one another. Some translations have it as continuing the previous sec- uh, sentence. Some have it as beginning this new section. I think it makes sense to begin this new section because the next three sections are talking about mutual submission, which is set up by the previous section in chapter 5. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's an introduction not just to the word about husbands and wives, but to children and parents, slaves and masters. Mutual submission is a general relational principle that God requires, not just a marriage principle, even though it's a good marriage principle. Peter gives the same instruction in 1 Peter chapter 5, when he instructs the elders not to lord authority over those whom they are leading, but to care for them with grace. Then he turns around and instructs the young men to accept the authority of the elders with humility for their own good. Back here in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is giving us a glimpse into the why behind the concept of mutual submission. Not just imitation of Christ, which it is, but reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's worship. It is worship to treat one another with mutual respect and submission. Why? Because of the divine image. We honor Christ when we acknowledge the image of God in each other. How do I know this? Because the Apostle James taught that when we bless one another and curse one another from the same mouth, this not ought to be so, says James in chapter 3, verse 10. James says the tongue is a dangerous thing. In James 3, verse 9, he says, sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. So James not only cites the image of God in man as a reason to treat one another with blessing and not a curse, but he contrasts disrespect for the image of God with the worship of our Lord and Father. You see the contrast? Mutual submission, and thus the submission of wife and husband to one another, begins as an act of worship. Not only that, but from the earliest scriptures we know that there is one God who is worthy of our worship. There is also a unity within humanity with respect to God, because we all bear his image. 
Yet we are all enslaved by sin and our fallen nature. There is no one who is righteous, not even one, the scriptures say. Because we can all gain access to restoration by the same means. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. So then Paul picks up the theme of unity of all humanity before God in Colossians 3, verse 9, when he teaches this. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. You know that scripture well. But did you catch that little word renewed? The new self is for us who were born into sin. The act of being renewed after the image of its creator, renewed, restored to what it originally was, created by God in the image of God for relationship with God. If you're not careful, you will miss the divine image thread throughout these scriptures, but it's there. Because all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis 1, when God said, let us make man in our own image to be like us, and he looked upon all he had made and said, this is very good in Genesis 1.31. And that as we are renewed and restored, we are all the same. We come all on the same footing. Galatians 3.28 repeats Paul's phrase, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is no male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He doesn't mean you are all the same, he doesn't mean uniformity. He means unity. He means you are one because you are all human. You will all bear the image of God. You all have fallen in sin. And you all have access to restoration in the same way through Jesus Christ. There is only one way. Jesus, God in the flesh, is our access to the one God who is worthy of worship. We are one with respect to him because all human beings bear his image. And when we treat one another with mutual submission and respect, we worship him because we honor his creation and the divine image. So before we go on to see what Paul has to say specifically to wives and husbands, then he'll talk specifically to children and parents, then he'll talk specifically to slaves, to slaves and masters. Be sure that you know there is no hierarchy of value between the sexes. There is no misogynistic agenda within the mind of the creator, but that we are subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Mutual submission begins as an act of worship of God. However, there is not only unity in the divine image, there is also diversity. Not just unity, but diversity and embracing our roles in the male-female relationship designed by God echoes the diversity of God. Embracing our roles echoes the diversity of God. See, Paul has a lot to say to both wives and husbands when it comes to mutual submission for the sake of Christ. And he gives them different responsibilities. A lot of controversy has been, been discussed and debated because of these differing roles. I just want to acknowledge the fact that he begins with mutual submission, but he proceeds to discrete roles. We can't get around that. So Paul starts by talking to the women, and he describes not their worth, not their value, but, but their role with respect to the relationship and their responsibilities with respect to that role. Despite the fact that there is no male or female when it comes to our standing before God, no difference between the sexes when it comes to access to God or value to God, there clearly is some difference between male and female. That's how we all got here. You can laugh a little bit. We're different because God wanted us to be different. Why? 
not just to play different roles. I believe that he wanted us to be different to reflect his diversity. Remember back to Genesis 1, which is where we just came from, where it all started, the beginning, the creation. Isn't it interesting that in the very first mention of the creation of humanity, God mentions both man and woman? You go back to Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Isn't it stunning that the writer twice emphasizes the image of God in his creation of man and then couples this to the male and female versions of his creation? See, there's something about the image of God that is displayed by mankind created as male and female. What is it? Is it that we were made for relationship? Maybe. Certainly the capacity to exist and thrive in relationships is part of the image of God in man, reflected by the Trinity, existing in perfect relationship for eternity past in mutual love and interaction. But you don't need gender for relationship. Yet God sees fit to reveal himself to us, not just as heavenly father, not just with paternal characteristics, but remember Ruth chapter 2, verse 12. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. The imagery of God taking us under his wings and being our shelter and our reference is a maternal image. It's the image of a mother hen. It's repeated throughout the Psalms, even by Jesus in Matthew 23, where he says, Jerusalem, you who kill prophets and stone those who sent you. Remember how he laments over Jerusalem? How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, yet you were not willing. That's a maternal image. Isaiah confirms by saying, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. That's God speaking through the prophet. I'm not saying we should depict God as a woman. Clearly, Jesus prays to the Father. Jesus himself was a man. But for some reason, God, who is diverse in himself as three persons, chose to express himself by making his image bearers Male and female. Then he relates back to us in male and female imagery when he talks about his characteristics. So as a result, to embrace our gender is to honor his expression of the divine image in us and to submit to one another in the way he prescribes Women acknowledging man as the head of the relationship, man taking responsibility for the relationship before God and sacrificing himself for the woman, embracing our roles in the husband-wife, wife-husband relationship echoes the diversity of God. And I think it honors the divine image. Is it getting hot in here? <laughs> maybe I'm going from, maybe I'm with Derek going from preaching to meddling. I don't know. I really think that embracing our roles echoes the divine image. And I think if, we honest, if, if I honestly prioritize my spouse over myself, if I as a husband genuinely seek the kingdom of God first before my own benefit, this will not be a controversial view. If my wife honestly prioritizes her husband over herself and genuinely seeks the kingdom of God, I don't really see how that relational element can go awry. That seems like a pretty cool thing to me. That seems like we can then celebrate the diversity of God that he's chosen to reflect in the diversity of the sexes. If I see my gender through the lens of the image of God within me, that's something to celebrate. That's pretty cool. So mutual submission begins as worship of God, embracing our roles, echoes the diversity of God. Third, self-sacrifice embodies the love of God. Self-sacrifice embodies the love of God. You see, Paul now turns to men, and he begins to expound on the role of the husband and the responsibility of the husband. But he doesn't give the husband freedom to wield authority over his wife in any way he seems fit. 
He doesn't liberate the husband to get his own way by exploiting the submission of his wife. Instead, Paul commands him, and it is a command, to love. In verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Why does Paul give the command to, for, to husbands and not wives to love? Why does he command husbands to love and not, and not wives? Obviously, it's implicit in this teaching and in many other places that wives should love their husbands. But this command is specifically directed to the man. I think there are at least three reasons. One is that I think that ladies are, on the whole, uh, have an easier time being loving than men. I think that's just true. It's not true in every case. It's not a, I don't mean to make a stereotype. But I think ladies often reveal their compassionate nature more easily than we men. We have a harder time to do that, whether it's socialization, whether it's innate in our fallen nature. They show their nurturing side more easily. That's why the image of the mother hen makes sense to us, and we understand it. Remember, when God wanted to show his compassion and his desire to shelter the nation of Israel under his care, he chose a maternal image. But there's a second reason. I don't think that's the most important reason. I think that in God's economy, love is a quality that goes hand in hand with leadership. And this passage is setting up a leadership dynamic in the household, placing men in the role of responsibility for leading and representing the household before God. Not just authority, but responsibility to God. I remember listening to Dr. Dallas Willard lecture on spiritual leadership years ago. You remember Willard, the brilliant philosopher from Southern California who went home to be with the Lord in 2013, taught for 47 years at USC, a secular institution, but shone more brightly than most as a light for the gospel and led the way in shaping our modern understanding of the spiritual life and spiritual formation and things like that. He wrote lots of seminal books. You probably know The Divine Conspiracy. If you haven't read it, you've heard of it. But he was also an expert on spiritual leadership. And I remember hearing him open his teaching series, a series of lectures on leadership with what text above all others? 1 Corinthians 13. Now that's the text we use at weddings, isn't it? That's the love chapter. That's the mushy part of Paul's apologetic. The one, we, the one we, we, we talk about when we want to talk about emotions and all that. Not leadership. But yet love and leadership, says Willard, and I believe says the scriptures, cannot be separated in God's economy. In fact, one is a prerequisite for the other. Why? 1 Corinthians 13, you know it. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophecy, understanding, and knowledge and faith to move mountains, but don't have love, I am nothing. What does that mean? That means all the skills in the world, all the influential power in the world, all the capability of a leader to influence and inspire and organize and manage and all the faith in the world is nothing without love. That's why Dallas Willard began his instruction to leaders with love. Fast forward over to Ephesians, and Paul sets up the leadership structure of the home. And he places love right at the center of the responsibilities of the spiritual head. It's not that women don't need to love. It's that you need love if you're going to fulfill this responsibility, this role. Leadership and love go hand in hand. So husbands, you better listen. What does it mean to love your wife? Go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Be patient. Be kind. Don't be envious, even though she might be gifted in ways that you are not. Don't boast. Don't be proud. Don't be rude. Don't seek your own gain. Don't get angry quickly. Don't keep a scorecard of who did what, when, to whom. Don't delight in doing evil. Don't hide in the shadows. But rejoice 
in the truth. Derek's going to preach to the men and fathers next week, so I won't do that now, except to say that if men were to merely set this as our goal, the kingdom of God would explode into our families. So Paul gives the command to love, not because men are the only ones who need it or because they need it more than women, even though they probably do, but because love and leadership are bound together by God. But there's a third reason for the command to love, and that is reflected in the relationship between Christ and the church. There's a whole lot of that in in this passage. See, don't forget about the divine image. In his charge to husbands to love his wife, their wives, Paul is not only teaching mutual submission, he's not only teaching a diversity of roles, he's teaching the nature of God the nature of Christ and the aspect of the image of God within us that most closely ties us to his heart. It's love. God made man with the capacity to love. No other creature has that. And when you love, says Paul, you are modeling Christ and the church. Self-sacrifice embodies the love of God. You see it nowhere more clearly than in what Christ has done for us. Paul is not saying that Christ's love for the church is like a husband's love for his wife. He's not using using Christ as the illustration for, for teaching about us. It's completely the opposite. The marriage relationship is a picture of the deeper truth, which is Christ's love for the church. So when you honor your wife, men, when you love her and treat her with respect, and when you subordinate your own desires for her sake, you are preaching the gospel of love and the love of Christ and his sacrifice for us. That's pretty cool how he does that. That's why Jesus said in in John chapter 10, excuse me, in Mark chapter 10, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Husbands, you get to paint a beautiful picture of Christ giving his life for the church, not because he hated his life. His life is glorious. He's God. But for his own sake, he gives himself up for the bride, for the church, in the ultimate act of love. So if you have the mind of Christ, Paul says in Philippians 2, if you have the mind of Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted, has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Sacrifice of love, Paul requires of husbands, is not that you hate your own body. Man, it's not that you despise yourself. You love your body. So you love your wife as a part of your body. That's what he means. And you glorify God when you love her as yourself. But not just that. Watch this now. Remember back in in Genesis at the very beginning. We already saw how in Genesis chapter 1, the divine image was instantiated in mankind by creating them male and female. But in Genesis chapter 2, over the page, God lays out in more detail how this happened. And we learn that he made woman from the body of man. That is not a fairy tale. From his rib within, so that in Genesis 2, 23, man exclaims, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman woman, because she was taken out of man. He's so thankful to God for the helpmate that she has given him, that he has given him, for the companion he has given him. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Do you see how this lights Ephesians 5? 
Because when Paul says in verse 28, the husbands should love their wives like their own bodies because she's a part of his body, flesh of flesh. So God's creative plan shines brightly from the very beginning, from one end of the scriptures all the way to the other, all the way into the New Testament in Paul's letters for husbands and wives as they reflect the divine image of God and his purpose, his purpose in creating man and woman. Which brings us to the fourth and last point, the divine image in us reflects the plan of God. The divine image reflects the plan of God. If you think I'm stretching the spiritual connection by reading Genesis into Ephesians, hold on, because it gets gets even better. Because Paul, at the end of his discourse to husbands, what does he do? He turns around and quotes Genesis chapter 2. I'm not just pulling that out of the air. In verse 31, Paul quotes Genesis chapter 2. For this reason... Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Remember the two accounts of creation in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 1 is the sequence of events that happened in creation. Genesis 2 adds more detail, particularly with respect to man and woman. We already know that both male and female were created. That's contained in Genesis 1.27. We don't need to know that again. But God wants us to know more. He wants us to know more about that. He wants us to know that he didn't create woman as an afterthought. Maleness and femaleness are inherent in the divine image of God placed in humanity. That's Genesis 1. But in Genesis 2... He hashes out their differences. And in Genesis 2, he hashes out his purpose and his plan. God's purpose in creating the woman is that there would be a suitable relationship, a suitable companion and partnership between the man and woman. She would help him in exercising his dominion over the earth. Dominion, which is, by the way, another aspect of the image of God in us, the ability to rule things. And right from the beginning, God makes known his plan for the diversity of male and female that he's created. Right in Genesis 2.24, which Paul quotes in Ephesians 5.31. It's the same same thing. It's the same phrase. God's plan is that a man would leave his own blood family and join to his wife. They become one flesh because they began as one flesh in God's created family. Purpose. Woman was taken out of man in creation, which is exactly why the married couple joined together become one flesh. And so God intends to use this unit, this relationship, to grow humanity. He doesn't prescribe it for all people at all times. He says, I'm going to use this unit as the building block of my social structure and to propagate through the ages and generations. Do you see out of this purposeful act of God in creation itself why dishonoring and ignoring God's plan is an offense to creation, an offense to the image of God, the divine image? The diversity that God has created in man and woman not only reflects the diversity of God himself, but the glory of his plan. Not just his plan for marriage, but his plan for the church, for all of us. So the mystery of Christ, who is head of the church, Paul says, this is a mystery. I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. He goes off on a theological tangent because it's so much more important that we see that. The mystery of Christ, who is head of the church, is the template for the bride and groom coming together in that sacred union. And by this union, Christ purifies the church and makes her holy, and those who comprise the church, that's us, are restored to the perfection of the divine image for which we were created. Wow. It's pretty good. Therefore, disregarding the definition of marriage as being between one man and one woman not only disregards the image of God represented in man and woman, 
but also makes a mockery of God's plan of redemption that God himself compares to the marriage relationship. It's not just about you. It's not just about marriage. It's about God and his plan for the earth. Why would we want to mess with that? On what basis could we validate an alternative, an alternative lifestyle to the one that God has prescribed so consistently throughout the scriptures? Why would we distort the plan of God because it feels right? There are increasing numbers of people within the church today that are being persuaded that we should celebrate an alternative. We don't even call it an alternative lifestyle anymore. It's so, it's so common. That's an anachronistic term. We should celebrate all forms of gender, identity, and marriage permutations simply because it's love and love feels good. But can we distort the plan of God because it feels right to us? Isn't it at least possible that the distortion is not because God made some people this way, but rather because the image of God in us has been distorted by sin? I know I'm off. I'm off on a tangent, but it's in the text. This is contained here in God's design, in God's plan. It's about so much more than just what happens in that marriage relationship. It's about his entire plan that he's demonstrating for us by the way we live in relationship. That's why arguing that same-sex union is a celebration of how God made us to be is completely missing the point of how God made us to be, the point of the divine image imprinted within us and modeled to reflect the union of Christ and the church, which is the way that we are saved. We attack our very salvation when we attack the divine image. I need to wrap up because it's getting late. And I know it's been heavy going this morning, tying together a lot of a lot of different scripture, but it's important that we see the thread of the divine image. Remember that video we played a few weeks ago on that thread going through the entire, it runs through the entire scriptures. I know you have to concentrate really hard to follow me, but, but I hope you're connecting that trail. I hope it's worth it. The, the very simple application I wanna bring us to, and I hope you will take this away, is so, it's very practical. As we conclude this morning, why don't you bring all of the context, all the instruction from Paul, all of the connectivity between Genesis and Ephesians right into, into our own lives and ask this question. What challenge to the divine image are you facing in the male-female relationships of your life? or in the maleness and femaleness? What challenge to the divine image are you facing? Because Satan will attack this. Is it the impending collapse of a marriage? Is it strain, tension, so thick and so deep that you think the best thing you can do is to just ignore it until it completely explodes? Is it confusion about who you are, about who God made you to be? Is it the temptation to fulfill your sexual nature outside of the boundaries of marriage that God has prescribed? Is it uncertainty about God's plan, the same-sex distortion of that plan, or what he truly wants you to be? Is it doubt that he wants you to be happy and fulfilled and joyful? These are real and difficult challenges because they sit at the heart of who God created us to be. But in light of the divine image, the very fingerprint of God on your being, on your soul, how can we ignore the importance of this question? If a marriage is in trouble, how can we do anything but seek out every possible option for restoration? Lots of times that's a professional counselor. Lots of times that's expensive. Why would we not sacrifice 
to give everything towards seeing the divine image restored in that most sacred relationship. Why are we so hesitant to get help? Maybe because we're afraid of being judged in places like this? By people like us? Oh God, that should never be so. We should help one another, encourage one another, build one another up. I want to offer you three suggestions this morning to deal with these issues, with these questions that are present in some way in all of our lives. And it's very simple. Number one, discover the image of God within you. Discover the image of God within you. Know that he created your inmost being, as the psalmist says. Know that he loves you with an unconditional and undying love because you are his special creation. You matter to God. And bringing you through whatever challenge you face is what he wants to do. Number two, discover the plan of God for you. Discover the image of God within you. Discover the plan of God for you. He wants to restore you. If you haven't found that renewed self, the new life through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of your sin and right relationship with God, that's the beginning, beginning of it all. You can start today. All you need to do is ask him to be your savior, to be Lord of your life. Acknowledge your inability to do that yourself. And he will do it for you. He will restore you to himself and begin the healing process of the broken places in your life. He's doing it now with so many of us. Discover the image of God within you. Discover the plan of God for you. And discover the blessing of God awaiting you. He wants you to pursue his path and live as you were intended to live, to be a disciple, to get to know Jesus, to learn to follow his ways and be empowered by his Holy Spirit and transformed by his power. Growth happens like that. And for husbands and wives, growth can happen, should happen, together. Maybe today will be the day that you resolve to honor the divine image in you. I hope you will take the first step we can do that together. Let's pray. God of the universe, Lord of creation, Heavenly Father, Lord of each one who has called on your name, thank you for the incredible blessing and the unbelievable reality of your divine image in us. Teach us in all of our relationships, Lord, to honor you by honoring that image, to honor one another in mutual submission and love. We will give you all the glory for what becomes of it as we continue to be restored to the perfection of the image of Christ. We thank you. And love you in his name.